The Young Ravens That Call Upon Him by Charles G. D. Roberts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Kaplan. It was just before dawn, and a grayness was beginning to trouble the dark about the top of the mountain. Even at that cold height, there was no wind. The veil of cloud that hid the stars hung but a handbreadth above the naked stomach. To eastward the peak broke away sheer, beetling in a perpetual menace to the valleys and the lower hills. Just under the brow on a splintered and creviced ledge was the nest of eagles. As the thick dark shrank down the steep like a receding tide and the grayness reached the ragged heap of branches forming the nest, the young eagles stirred uneasily under the loose droop of their mother's wings. She raised her head and peered about her, slightly lifting her wings as she did so, and the nestlings, complaining at the chill air that came in upon their unfledged bodies, thrust themselves up amid the warm feathers of her thighs. The male bird, perched on a jutting fragment beside the nest, did not move, but he was awake. His white, narrow, flat-crowned head was turned to one side, and his yellow eye, under its straight, fierce lid, watched the pale streak that was growing along the distant eastern sea-line. The great birds were racked with hunger. Even the nestlings, to meet the petitions of whose gaping beaks they stinted themselves without mercy, felt meager and uncomforted. Day after day the parent birds had fished almost in vain. Day after day their wide and tireless hunting had brought them scant reward. The schools of alewives, mackerel, and herring seemed to shun their shores that spring. The rabbits seemed to have fled from all the coverts about the mountain. The mother eagle, larger and of mightier wing than her mate, looked as if she had met with misadventure. Her plumage was disordered. Her eyes, fiercely and restlessly anxious, at moments grew dull as if with exhaustion. On the day before, while circling at her viewless height above a lake far inland, she had marked a huge lake trout basking near the surface of the water. Dropping upon it, with half-closed hissing wings, she had fixed her talons in its back. But the fish had proved too powerful for her. Again and again it had dragged her under water, and she had been almost drowned before she could unloose the terrible grip of her claws. Hardly and late had she beaten her way back to the mountain top. And now the pale streak in the east grew ruddy. Rust-red stains and purple, crawling fissures began to show on the rocky face of the peak. A piece of scarlet cloth, woven among the faggots of the nest, glowed like new blood in the increasing light. And presently a wave of rose appeared to break and wash down over the summit, as the rim of the sun came above the horizon. The male eagle stretched his head far out over the depth, lifted his wings, and screamed harshly, as if in greeting of the day. He paused a moment in that position, rolling his eye upon the nest. Then his head went lower, his wings spread wider, and he launched himself smoothly and swiftly into the abyss of air, as a swimmer glides into the sea. The female watched him, a faint wraith of a bird darting through the gloom, till presently, completing his mighty arc, he rose again into the full light of the morning. Then on level, all but moveless wing, he sailed away toward the horizon. As the sun rose higher and higher, the darkness began to melt on tops of the lower hills, and to diminish on the slopes of the upland pastures, lingering in the valleys as the snow delays there in the spring. As point by point the landscape uncovered itself to his view, the eagle shaped his flight into a vast circle, or rather into a series of stupendous loops. His neck was stretched toward the earth, in the intensity of his search for something to ease the bitter hunger of his nestlings and of his mate. Not far from the sea, and still in darkness, stood a low round hill or swelling upland, bleak and shelterless, whipped by every wind that heavens could let loose, it bore no bush but an occasional juniper scrub. It was covered with mossy hillocks, and with short grass, meager but sweet. There, in the chilly gloom, straining her ears to catch the lightest footfall of approaching peril, 
but hearing only the hushed thunder of the surf, stood a lonely ewe over the lamb to which she had given birth in the night. Having lost the flock when the pangs of travail came upon her, the unwanted solitude filled her with apprehension. But as soon as the first feeble bleeding of the lamb fell upon her ear, everything was changed. Her terrors all at once increased tenfold, but they were for her young, not for herself and with them came a strange boldness such as her heart had never known before. As the little weakening shivered against her side, she uttered low, short bleats and murmurs of tenderness. When an owl hooted in the woods across the valley, she raised her head angrily and faced the sound, suspecting a menace to her young. When a mouse scurried past her with a small rustling noise amid the withered mosses of the hillock, she stamped fiercely and would have charged had the intruder been a lion. When the first gray of dawn descended over the pasture, the ewe feasted her eyes with the sight of the trembling little creature as it lay on the wet grass. With gentle nose she coaxed it and caressed it till presently it struggled to its feet, and with its pathetically awkward legs spread wide apart to preserve its balance, it began to nurse. Turning her head as far around as she could, the ewe watched its every motion with soft murmurings of delight and now that wave of rose which had long ago washed the mountain and waked the eagles spread tenderly across the open pasture. The lamb stopped nursing, and the ewe, moving forward two or three steps, tried to persuade it to follow her. She was anxious that it should join as soon as possible, learn to walk freely, so that they may together rejoin the flock. She felt that the open pasture was full of dangers. The lamb seemed afraid to take so many steps. It shook its ears and bleated piteously. The mother returned to its side, caressed it anew, pushed it with her nose, and again moved away a few feet, urging it to go with her. Again the feeble little creature refused, bleeding loudly. At this moment there came a terrible hissing rush out of the sky, and a great form fell upon the lamb. The ewe wheeled and charged madly, but the same instant the eagle, with two mighty buffetings of its wings, rose beyond her reach and soared away toward the mountain. The lamb hung limp from his talons, and with piteous cries the ewe ran beneath, gazing upward and stumbling over the hillocks and juniper bushes. In the nest of the eagles there was content. The pain of their hunger appeased, the nestlings lay dozing in the sun, the neck of one resting across the back of the other. The triumphant male sat erect upon his perch, staring out over the splendid world that displayed itself beneath him. Now and again he half lifted his wings and screamed joyously at the sun. The mother bird, perched upon a limb on the edge of the nest, busily rearranged her plumage. At times she stooped her head into the nest to utter over her sleeping eaglets a soft chuckling noise which seemed to come from the bottom of her throat. But hither and thither, over the round bleak hill, wandered the ewe, calling for her lamb, unmindful of the flock which had been moved to other pastures. End of The Young Ravens That Call Upon Him by Charles G. D. Roberts